Before we begin, this week we have Yom Kippur, and customarily, before Yom Kippur, you're supposed to reach out to your friends and family and co-workers and colleagues and acquaintances and make sure that you're all squared with them, you're all good with them. So uh, I want to do that to my dear friends and all of you to make sure that we're okay. If there's anything that I uh, didn't respect you or didn't answer your question in a timely fashion, uh, please forgive me. I have absolutely no claims against anyone. I love all of y'all. And uh, it was an amazing year. Look forward to another amazing year in uh, 5780 after, after Yom Kippur. Now, what I selected to do today, it's something that the more I researched, the more I studied, the more I prepared, the more apprehensive, the more uncertain I am about this topic. I may have made a major mistake in selecting it, or it may have been the best thing ever. I'm not sure, because the subject is very enlightening, very intriguing. It's going to be a new format, one that I don't believe we've done in the past. It's going to, I think, answer a lot of questions, but probably raise more questions than it's going to answer. In addition, I think the content of the subject is quite challenging, uh, perhaps a bit uh, frightening maybe, but I think in proportion to how frightening it is, that's also how valuable it is. It's very valuable, but very different, and it may have made a big mistake, but we'll find out. It's going to be an experiment. We know that on Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur afternoon, by Mincha, by the afternoon prayers, they read the Torah, and then they put the Torah away, and then they read from the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is one of the books of the Torah. It's actually not not its own book. If you count the 24 books of the Bible, it's part of of one book called the Treyas, or the 12 prophets, the 12 minor prophets, that are lumped together into one book. It's a very short book. The whole book is read on Yom Kippur afternoon. It's only got 48 verses. And the relation to the theme of Yom Kippur is obvious to anyone who reads the book of Jonah. It orients, of course, around repentance. Both of the protagonists of the story, namely the prophet Jonah, Jonah ben Amittai, and the people of Nineveh, the people of the great sprawling metropolis who he is tasked by God to go have them rectify their ways, and they collectively change their behavior, and they're spared from destruction. So obviously, the overlap with the theme of the day of Yom Kippur, the theme of repentance, the overlap between that and the book of Jonah is patent to all. But in Jewish literature, and certainly in Jewish mysticism slash Kabbalah, there's always going to be multi-layers. So, for example, you read the Torah and you open Rashi. And Rashi, of course, is the most basic of commentaries, the most uh, the fundamental commentary in the Torah, the greatest commentary in the Torah. And he always is going to give you a little portal, a little window into a deeper level of understanding of the text. So if there's a dialogue, we'll understand what really is behind the dialogue. If there's a connection between two verses or two sections, we'll understand the deep meaning. If there's a puzzling narrative, he'll illuminate it. He's always going to give us a little bit of a deeper insight into understanding the text. And that applies with Rashi's commentary throughout the entire Torah and the, throughout the entire Tanakh, throughout the entire uh, Bible. But there's also a different kind of multi-layered understanding of Torah that is generally called what's called the Pardes, which stands for the, the four different strata of understanding of any Torah idea. You have a Torah idea, a verse, for example. There's the, the, the simple understanding, which is what we always do. And Rashi is always going to help us understand the simple Version, and then there's the Midrashic, and then there's the Kabbalistic, and there's the hidden, and then there's the esoteric, and then there's the Hamalad. There's all these deeper layers of strata that most of the time we, we, we tend to avoid in our, in our studies because it's a little bit above us. What I want to do today is I want to take the book of Jonah and I want to explore it a little bit on that deeper level. 
I want to see the the hidden Kabbalistic story embedded beneath the surface story and discover something so incredible and so beautiful that just as the the simple version of the story, the one that's just if you just read it and follow you follow the narrative, just as that is very relevant to the festival of Yom Kippur and the themes of Yom Kippur, we find an equally topical version of this story on an entirely different level with different characters and different interpretations and different messages, but that's also very relevant, maybe even more relevant to the festival of Yom Kippur. So let's go through the basic story on a basic level and then try to go one flight beneath the deck like Jonah did and uh, see what we discover. So you read the first chapter of the book of Jonah and it tells the story of a apparently renegade prophet by the name of Jonah. He defies the directive of God. He refuses to go castigate the people of Nineveh. And instead, he tries to escape from God and go to a different place called Tarshish with decidedly mixed results, shall we say. So he descends to Jaffa or Yafo, and he boards a ship to Tarshish. He pays his fare, and he embarks on the journey. But God's not happy with him. He's, after all, been given the very clear instruction, go to Nineveh and have them repent. And instead, he tries to escape from God, and he tries to go to some other place. So God sends the hurricane. God sends the jail, and the ship is thrown into grave danger. And all the sailors of the ship are freaking out. And they're all pagans. They're all praying to their own idols. And, of course, those prayers yield no fruit. Meanwhile, Jonah, totally nonplussed, he heads below deck and goes to a very deep sleep. And the captain discovers Jonah... And he wakes him up. He says, what are you doing? Everyone's everyone's all nervous. Everyone's praying. How could you sit there idly and not pray? You have to pray to your God. Maybe your God will help us. Maybe he will help uh, spare the ship. And the sailors figure out that one of them is guilty. So they do a lottery to figure out who's the guilty party. And they put everyone's name, all the passengers, in a hat. And they pick out the name. It's Jonah. Jonah's the guilty party. He says, yes, I'm the guilty party. And they begin to pester him with questions. They asked him, what do you do? What's your business? Where are you from? Which land is yours? Which people do you belong to? Very specific questions that they're interrogating him uh, over here with. And he responds to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear God, the God of the heavens. He made both the land and the sea. And he's guilty. They got even more afraid. And they asked him, what do we do? What can we do to make the waters calm down? He says, well, you have to lift me up and chuck me into the water. And initially they demurred and they tried to row really quickly back to the shore. And it wasn't uh, efficacious. The seas got even stormier. They prayed to God, make sure that we don't kill innocent men. And they lift up Jonah and they cast him into the sea and right away, the hurricane stopped. In fact, the Midrash says they tried to lift him out, and they lift him out, and it started again. And they throw him back in, and it stopped. So clearly, this is evidence. Jonah's the guilty party, and God's here intervening with the weather. And they get even more scared of God, the sailors do. They start uh, offering sacrifice to him and making vows to him. And that's the end of chapter 1, 16 verses. Jonah's in the sea, and the waters come, and the boat is totally at ease. And the rest of the book is going to follow Jonah. Uh, he's going to be swallowed by the fish. He's going to be in the fish's belly for three days. He's going to be a very long prayer to God from the belly of the fish. He's going to be spit out. According to the Talmud, he spit out from one fish to a different fish. And he eventually ends up on dry land. And he has a second chance. And that's another idea, uh, obviously, the theme of, of Yom Kippur. Given another chance with repentance. And again, God tells him to go to Nineveh. This time he obeys. Nineveh, the great city, they heed the call of Jonah to repent, and this greatly distresses Jonah. He wants to die, he prays to die, and the book ends with God teaching him a valuable lesson uh, with a plant that wilts. That's the very quick version of the book of Jonah. And then we open up some of the other books, some of the other teachings, and find a deeper level of understanding uh, based upon the Kabbalah. 
Now, as a general rule, we know that the Torah is, is multi-layered. There's many, many sources that talk about the different hidden, arcane, esoteric levels of understanding of the Torah. For example, we're told, Shivim Panim Torah. there's 70 facets of Torah, which means you look at it from different angles, it could, you could see different uh, different ideas, at least 70 different facets in every verse of Torah. The verse compares Torah, the study of Torah, to taking a hammer and shattering a rock. And what that reveals, just like you shatter a rock, there's splinters, there's fragments heading in every direction. Similarly, if you deep you're, if you deepen your immersion into Torah, you'll see so many different angels, so many different understandings uh, of Torah that are that are latent within within the 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 message. Incidentally, the Talmud also says that our Yetzahara is compared to a stone heart, and when it's telling us this idea of studying Torah, it's like shattering the stone, which flies into all kinds of fragments. It's also revealing to us that you're actually fixing. Your central flaw, your central malady, namely the fact that you have the stone heart, that you have the eight Sahara, and that's that's also remediating your 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 problem, your fundamental flaw. So there's many sources to to affirm that there are many layers of understanding. And if you read stories in the Torah, even stories in the Talmud, conversations that these rabbis had doesn't seem to have immediate relevance. You, you don't know what the message you see. You could sense there's something hidden, but it, it doesn't make sense at any level that, we, that that you're conscious of. And you open up the other books and they're like, whew, they open your eyes and you see like, wow, this makes so much sense and how it connects to other sources and how it's hidden. It's like you take the message, you divide it up into five pieces, you scatter them throughout the Talmud. And that's how the architects of the Talmud were able to hide their message Write it in encoded, encrypted fashion. So that's the general idea. But there is a book written by the Gaon of Vilna. Gaon of Vilna is the uh, central Jewish character of the 18th century. And he writes a commentary the book of Jonah. And he says, I'm going to explain to you the book of Jonah, not on the simple level, not on the story, the people, individuals, but on a little bit of a deeper level. And what he tells us in his introduction that the book is hinting at the conflict and the tension of the soul and the body and the fact that the soul is given a mission to accomplish in life. Sometimes it's going to fail the mission. What happens when things go off script? What happens when things go awry? What happens when the soul does not follow its directive? What happens then? That's his general premise, and I don't want to spoil it, but he says that we see Jonah here. He has his first shot. He fails. He goes through this really difficult process, and he spit back on the shore and give him the second chance. The going of Vilna, and again, I don't want to get sidetracked with this question, but he says this 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 is revealing about the idea. You have one chance at accomplishing your mission. You may miss out on that, you may fail at that, and you may get another chance. That's the day of reincarnation, and we're going to talk about that. But hold the questions, because this could literally derail the class. <laughs> Not literally. Figuratively, completely derail it if we start going down that uh, that rabbit hole. So let's, start, let's just start reading the first chapter, the chapter that we read on the basic level, see what we discover on this deeper level. So the first verse introduces us to the prophet Jonah, and it tells us the word of God came to Jonah, Ben Amitai, Jonah, the son of Amitai. The Hebrew word for Jonah is Yonah, and the word Yonah also means an animal. Which animal? The dove. The dove, which is a kind of bird, makes a nice uh, memorable appearance in the Noah story, the flood story. So our guide, the Gona Villa, tells us that when it's talking about Jonah, of course, there's Jonah the prophet, there's the individual on that level. But on this level that we're going to be talking about, Jonah is a reference to man's soul, the central character, the protagonist, or maybe the villain, if you will, of the book of Jonah, is the human soul. And he goes on to explain why he's called Jonah, or at least in this allegorical Level, why is he called Yonah? Why is he compared to a dove? So he brings all kinds of evidence that the animal, the dove, 
is often compared to the soul and to the essence of the Jewish people and to holiness. And he brings some examples. So, for example, he, he, he quotes the verse in, in Hosea. The verse in Hosea 7.11, easy number for Americans to remember. It compares someone who's acting in a sinful way to a silly and heartless dove. You can think of a lot of ways to describe someone who is sinful. It describes him as a as a dove that acts silly and heartlessly. And of course, he quotes the, the Zohar and the, the Kabbalah, which explains that this refers to the soul gone awry. And there's also uh, other episodes that were told in Jewish literature that affirm that there's something really special about this stuff. So for example, the Talmud book of Shabbos, page 49a, is talking about the mitzvah of tefillin. Tefillin is uh, phylacteries in Greek, I think is the word. And it's the, the black boxes that we wear in the morning when you pray. Sometimes they used to wear it throughout the whole day. Some people still do that. But it's the black boxes made out of uh, animal, of leather, and it has the parchments of the Torah. It's supposed to kind of bind us with God. So it talks about how you have to have a clean body when you wear this film. That's the subject of the Gemara. But it brings a story of Elisha, the person who, to whom the episode of the wings happened. What's the episode of the wings? So it tells us that the Roman government, the wicked Roman government, in the words of the Talmud, they made a decree on the Jewish people. And they said, whoever dons tefillin, their brain is going to be gouged out of their skull. The Romans didn't play games. If they wanted to punish you, they did it in gruesome, horrific, macabre fashion. So if you wear tefillin, we're going to disgorge your brain. That's what the Romans said. And there was this one guy named Elisha. And he says, I'm wearing tefillin. Not only is he, not, is he wearing tefillin, he's hiding in his closet. He says, I, I always wear tefillin all day, and I'm not scared of the Romans. And he walked out in the street, fully bedecked with his tefillin. And there's a Roman official there, and he sees him. And they begin a chase. Elisha, wearing the tefillin, starts running, escaping from the from the officer. And the officer's chasing him. And, of course, he is able to catch up to him. So quickly... He takes off his tefillin from his head and from his arm, and he holds him in his hands. And the officer knows what's happening, and he says, open your hands. What do you have in your hands? And he says, to him, ah, it's, it's just a dove's wings. I'm holding dove wings. I'm, I'm holding some some food. Hey, I got some wings. I bought some wings in the store by the butcher, by the poultry section. I bought some wings. No big deal. So he's like, yes, I believe that when I see that. Open your hands. And he opens his hands. And a miracle happens. There's wings in his hands. And people were so wowed by the story, they renamed him. You're not just regular Elisha. You're Elisha to whom the story with the wings, the, the winged man, he's the winged man, the first winged man. He's Elisha, the master of the wings, because of this story. So the Talmud investigates, why was why was a dove's wings chosen to demonstrate? Why, why that? Says, says the Talmud, because the Jewish people compared to the dove. Why? Just as a dove can only save itself with its wings, so do the Jewish people only save themselves with their prayer. So again, we see something. There's some, there's some spiritual quality that our sages are assigning to the dove. And the Gona Vilna, when he brings this idea, he introduces that idea. He says, Yona, it's something spiritual. Yes, of course, on, on one level, it's talking about the individual, the person, the prophet, Jonah. But on this allegorical level, on the level of metaphor, it's talking about the soul. And here are some examples of the, of the soul being compared to, or something spiritual being compared to the dove. And, and the idea here is that the soul is something which is committed to doing what's right, even at great personal peril. Just as, you know, the embodiment, the archetype, the paradigmatic example of someone who's willing to forfeit all to do the mitzvah is Elisha. And, and here we see that there is the reference to the dove. In addition, our sages reveal to us that the dove in its nature, the, the bird in its nature, it doesn't mate with anyone besides for its spouse. Which means that if you have two doves, they become a couple. If one of them dies, the other one will be celibate for the rest of, the, rest of its life. It's, it's, it's in its nature. 
which again shows that it has a certain purity to it, has a certain spiritual characteristic to it, that it doesn't act in a promiscuous way even for birds. And similarly, our sages tell us that what's that's hinting is that the Jewish people were committed to God, God's committed to us. There's a union here, an unbreakable union between the Jewish people and 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 holiness. And again, that's why the dove is a great example to represent the soul. In addition, a fourth example that the Midrash tells us that there's that uh, you take uh, a dove to the slaughterhouse, it doesn't resist slaughter. All the other animals, they start squawking and making noise and trying to resist. The, the dove doesn't resist. And similar idea that the Jewish people, you know, when we are faced with a question of martyrdom, when our life is in the question, are we going to repudiate God to save our life? We're like the dove a little bit. The holiness is represented by the dove that we won't resist the will of God, even if it means dying as a result. So that's the first verse, Jonah. On this level, Jonah is a reference to the soul. But it's not just Jonah. His full name is Jonah ben Amitai, the son of Amitai. And on one level, that's his father's name. His father's name is Amitai, a nice Jewish name. But on this level, Amitai from the word emet. Emet means truth, which means the soul is descending from truth. The soul originates in a place of tremendous truth, of purity. And parenthetically, the Talmud says that the, the symbol, the emblem of God is truth. And therefore, what it's hinting at here in this level is that the soul derives from a place of total truth. So that's the introduction. And we could talk about this maybe at greater length, but the, the concept of the soul in, in, in Jewish philosophy, it's a very central idea. The idea that all of us, of course, we exist on one plane, we have the body, but we also have simultaneously the soul that's fused together with the body that animates it, gives it life, gives it vitality, infuses it with existence. It's like the software that makes the hardware work. And we also believe that you take the, the soul out of the body, the body no longer is functional. That's the definition of death, right? That the separation of soul and body, that the two things that are fused, the two opposites that are fused together are removed and no longer do you have life. But the soul is something which in, in Jewish literature, is something which is so lofty, so exalted, so spiritually sublime that it's almost unfathomable that it's here married with our our body, like our ephemeral earthly body. That's, that almost doesn't make any sense. So, for example, there's many sources to this. We talk about uh, Genesis. God blows the soul into the nostril of, of Adam. We have this body, this almost like an animal, and then boom, infused with a godly soul, like from God. Amazing idea. Talmud says that the child before a child is born, the child's reminded that you are similar to God. God's holy, you're holy. There's a certain equivalence almost, the holiness of God, the holiness of man's soul. There's a very long teaching in the Talmud book of Brachos, page 10a, that talks about five times King David in the book of Psalms makes a prayer called Bar Chinafshi, let my soul praise God. Why is David making this blessing, this prayer, this song, let my soul praise God? What's the connection between my soul and God? And why specifically five times? Talmud lists, there's five overlapping characteristics between God and the soul of man. And therefore, it's appropriate that our soul can praise God. Our body, it's, it's not very useful to praise God. It's the soul, really, that can have that connection. So that's the first verse. We meet Jonah, the son of Amittai, the soul of man. And what we read about in verse 2 is its mission. So what does God tell Jonah? Go to Nineveh, the great city, proclaim judgment to it, for their wickedness has come before me. The soul originates in one place, but is temporarily brought to a different place to accomplish a certain mission. Jonah is in one place. God says, go elsewhere. The soul is one place. God says, go elsewhere. Accomplish something. Get up from your place in heaven. Go to terra firma. Go to the world. And do something there for me. Now, Nineveh, of course, is a great city. We know that historically there's a great city called Nineveh. But in Hebrew, the word Nineveh 
means an abode. And it could be read that, that God is telling Jonah, go to this city. It's a sinful city and make it a more hospitable city for me. God wants us to fix, to perfect, to rectify, to purify, to refine this world so that it could be a proper abode for him. There's something that God almost is asking us to do to make the world a place where God could dwell. In fact, if you could distill the Jewish mission in life, like what role are we supposed to play? Using our soul, using the guidance that we got from the Torah, our objective is to make a parallel between this world and the world of the soul, to make them as indistinguishable as possible. For example, we say the Kaddish. What's the Kaddish? Oh, the Kaddish means holiness, right? What is the Kaddish is? Let your name be proclaimed here as it is there. That's what Abraham did. Abraham brings God to this world. God does not need to be introduced into the heavens above, into the spiritual realms. Everyone knows it there. Here, there's all these things that seem to obscure God. And therefore, here, it's a big deal. Abraham comes and says, well, there's actually one power. All the powers coalesced into one being, the one being that created it all. And that's such a novel idea. And Abraham begins the process of making this world also hospitable to God. And our nation, armed with our souls, is tasked with completing what Abraham began. Go to Ninveh. It's a big city. Fix it. Call out to it. And I, again, I'm skipping now over a lot of things here, a lot of details that, 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 that enrich the, the account. But there's all kinds of, of hints throughout all areas of Jewish literature. What does it mean a big city? Why is it, what is a small city? What is a big world? And I, I, I for the sake of, uh, of, of the time allotted, it's important for us to try to, to see the picture, to see the message. But every single word here, it's amazing. I'm reading this. Every single word is part of both narratives, the simple narrative and then this, this deeper level. And it all has meaning. Uh, what does it mean to call out to it? What exactly is the soul supposed to fix? What does it look like when the world is fixed? But that's the general idea. Jonah, the soul sent to the world. Go fix the world. And I think what makes this such a powerful way of understanding the, the book is that it's not only a historical account of what happened many thousands of years ago with a prophet named Jonah. It's happening every day within us. We have a little Jonah within us, or a big Jonah, or a powerful Jonah, certainly an invisible Jonah, the soul. And it was sent here. If we're here, obviously God believes that our soul has something to do. And therefore, he sends it down downstairs here to this world. And we have a mission. And whether or not we will accomplish our mission and how we will do it, it's in our hands. And the consequences of what happens when people opt to disobey or disregard their mission or not fully complete it, that's what it's going to talk about right away. So Jonah is given this mission. The soul is told, go fix the world. And instead it says, ah, I'd rather do something else. I have a different agenda. The soul, Jonah, is disobeying God. He's escaping God. Instead of going to Nineveh, he wants to go to a different city. He wants to go to Tarshish. Again, the name has meaning. The word Tarshish in, in the Torah, if you look at where it appears in the Torah, it's one of the names of the precious stones in the breastplate of the high priest. Tarsh is a very expensive, precious stone. The, the soul, instead of trying to obey the will of God, is drawn to, to beauty. He wants to pursue other pleasures, get dis, gets distracted from what God wants it to do, and wants to make a platform for other things, for, for desires. It's going to favor what is physically appealing and alluring over God's Mission. Where, where does it travel to? It's an amazing thing. We, we're given this details here in the Jonah story. Jonah gets up to escape to Tarshish. This is the third verse. And he goes to Yafo or Yafo. We know there's a city called Jaffa. 
in in, in the coast of Israel. But it's a, it seems like a, it's a trivial uh, detail that he goes to the port city of, of Jaffa or Jaffa. We know the Hebrew word for beauty is Yofi. And here, the Gona is explaining here, he's trying to find a a different angel. He wants to go to Tarshish, the city of Tarshish. He wants to pursue the beauty. And he gives a litany of examples where we find that people are drawn after the beauty. He goes to, for example, Adam and Eve. Eve sees that there's something appealing, there's something attractive about the tree, and that leads them down the sinful path. Jonah, the soul, is 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 lured after the beauty, after the city of Tarshish, after the Yafo, the, the the beauty that is so appealing, it's so desirable, and it decides to board the ship. In this story, the ship is the body, and another theme that appears again is that the dry land, that's where the soul is home, that's where it comes from, that's where it wants to go. No one ever gets on a ship. Maybe I guess today this would apply. People get on the ship because they want to go on the ship. But traditionally, you get, out, you get on a ship because you have a destination you want to go to. It's not a permanent designation. It's a, it's a way to, to transport from this place on land to that place on land. The soul, the Jonah, comes from a pl- place of land. That's where it's home. That's the heaven, what's called paradise, alternatively, Olam Abba. That's the place where the soul is permanently supposed to be located. And for some small amount of time, it's put in the ship, it's put in the body to accomplish something and to once again be restored to its more natural habitat on land in a place like in, in, he- in heaven, alternatively called Ganeid and Paradise, Olam Abba, a place where the soul is at ease. It's not in a normal setting when it is on the boat. That's the marriage of, of body and soul. And he quotes, again, there's so much, there's so much richness to these messages, to these uh, connections. For example, he quotes a, a Talmud in the book of Tamid, page 33a. It talks about a, a dialogue that happened between Alexander the Great and the sages of the South. There's 10 questions that Alexander asked the Jewish sages of the South. We don't, we don't get details as to who they are, but it's Jewish sages of the South. And he asked them, among his uh, 10 questions was the following question, is it better for a person to live at sea or is it better for a person to live on dry land? And they said to him, it's better to live on dry land because when someone is at sea, they're unsettled. They're not at ease until they reach the dry land. Now, if you just read that Talmud, you're like, this is such a lame dialogue between Alexander the Great. This is what he's asking, and this is what they're responding. It's such a silly thing to talk about. Is it better to live over here or better to live over there? Like, why is that relevant to us? Now that we have this paradigm that what it's talking, that, that it, what it's hinting at, when we talk in the Jonah story, but on that l- deeper level, what it's hinting at is the dry land is the soul's abode, is the soul's place of origin, is the soul's desired location. And the the sea, well, that's this temporary time in the middle where the soul is married to the body, where the soul goes into the ship, where Jonah descends to the ship. That's our time here. That's the fusion of body and soul. Now there's a deep, deeper meaning. Alexander the Great. If there's anyone that enjoyed life, it was him. And he's asking the question, you know, you Jews, you believe in this afterlife and the fact that the soul's going to leave and it's going to go to the dry land for the soul. What's better? Like someone like me, who's really enjoying my time here, everything I want is at my fingertips. For me, is it better to have the dry land or is it better for to, 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 have to be at the sea? Is it better for me to be here in the sea? Because things are so good for me. If there's any sailor that's having a good time, it would be me. So maybe, you know, you Jews, you guys suffer. That's kind of your thing. You like to suffer or you end up finding creative ways to absorb more pain. Okay, so you guys, it's better for you to, to think about all my butt, to think about the dry land. But maybe for me, maybe it's better for me to be here at sea in earth. I'm having a grand old time. So they respond to him, yes, maybe there is legitimacy to your question. 
But even someone like you, there is a little bit uncertainty. You know, a couple of years ago, we had the, uh, what was it, Costa Concordia? What was the name of that bitch ship? There was trouble in paradise, right? You were on, you were on the, the, the cruise ship with all the amenities in the world and things didn't work out so well, right? You know, there's a little scintilla of uncertainty even when you're at, at sea on that level. Even you, Alexander, there's a niggling worry, concern until things settle down. Who knows? There's uncertainty in the future. So even someone like you, things aren't, aren't that great. But again, that's another example of, of this, of this paradigm, the body and the soul, Jonah is the soul, the ship is the body, and we'll see what the sailors are in a second. The ship is the body, and this is a temporary union from land to land, from the place where the soul originates and is is at home, at ease, to the place where it is desiring to go or where its, its mission, God wants it to accomplish and to, and to return that. Now, it's interesting. He points out that the word being used here to describe a ship is ania or onia in Hebrew, modern Hebrew. But in in classical Hebrew, that word can mean a ship. It could also mean suffering. What it's hinting at is the fact that the relationship or the experience that the soul has while in the ship is one of suffering. It's not a natural fusion of body and soul so long as they're put together for the soul's perspective. It's like you take the uh, opposite sides of a magnet that are repelling each other because they're opposites and you force them together and you keep them together against their will. Similarly, God has taken the body and the soul, total opposites, and winding them up together to the great consternation of the soul, it's not comfortable at all on this trip. It doesn't want to be on the ship. It'd rather stay in the place where it's more comfortable, on dry land, in the place where it originates. It is not into this whole experiment. In fact, the Talmud talks about how the angel takes the soul out of the vault in which the souls are stored and brings it to God and God and makes all these pronouncements and says, okay, now it's time for you to get into the body. And the angel starts protesting like he never heard before. What? What are you suggesting? Where do I go? It's crazy. It's dangerous. I'm happy here. Don't take me there. It's forced into the onia. It's forced into the suffering. It's forced into the ship. Yes, it's also forced into this very unnatural and uncomfortable and painful experience to be bound with with the body. Now, I want to point out, I have a copy of this book, which is an adaptation of this whole idea, and they call the Book of Jonah, Journey of the Soul, and it has it in English and in Hebrew. But there is a, a running motif throughout the commentary, which talks about the masculine versus feminine. We know in, in many languages, words can have a, a masculine version and a feminine version. So he actually goes to that level of every word when it pivots from masculine to feminine, feminine to masculine. What the meaning is, you know, is the word neshama is feminine, yet it's being portrayed as masculine. What's the relationship between body and soul? Who's the masculine? Who's the feminine? It's a, a fascinating element that we're not going to get into, but it just, uh, we'll just throw that out there if you want to pursue this a little further it does go to even uh, deeper levels that we're going to talk about. So Jonah, the soul, goes to the ship, the body, and he pays his fare. Again, another trivial or seemingly trivial part of the story, he pays his fear. What does that even mean? So on, on our level, how it could be interpreted is that the soul is now capitulating. It's kind of, it's paying its fear. It's going to just like someone you pay something, you're diminished, right? You have you have money, then you have less of it. Soul has holiness, it has less of it now. Even by entering the ship, its its spiritual level, its spiritual purity is already on more shaky grounds. It's sullied a little bit, it's diminished a little bit. And the Talbot, in fact, says that when Jonah went on the ship, he actually paid for everyone's fare. What does that even mean? So on this level. 
it's explained by the Gon of Vilna. What that means is, is that, you know, who actually suffers for the sins of the body? The soul. So you have the soul paying for everyone's fare, covering everyone's tab. Everyone else is having a great time, but it's all coming out of the soul's pocket. Another, another way to another deep level. I mean, he's descending into the ship. Again, the, the verse is, is very clear. Not just that he's going into the ship, he's descending. There's a certain demotion that he's going to experience from the highest of highs, from the land, from the place where it is perched on top of, of the world. And now it's, it's kind of, it's traveling on, on, at sea. It's, it's been demoted. And because he's intending to go away from God, what does God do? God sends the great mighty wind, the hurricane is sent upon the sea to threaten the ship with being capsized. The way this is explained is that because man is sinning, because Jonah the soul is not doing its mission, it's time for it to be faced with a reckoning. And God sends his angels to go take the soul out of there. The soul has had its opportunity and it's not doing its job. So the angel of death is appointed to go extract the soul. You've had your time. You've had your opportunity. You didn't do your job. It's time for you to be pulled out of the mission. And the ship is starting to shake. The body is starting to to get ill. And of course, illness, we, we believe, on at least on a spiritual level, illness is God saying, what's wrong with you? Fix your ways. Amend your ways. I'm coming after you. Take the message home. To us, it's, 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 it's a physical ailment that could have happened to anyone. Maybe you should have watched your carbs more. But here, what, what we're discovering here on this level is that God is manipulating the weather, sending the prosecuting angels to go threaten the whole boat with the soul in it, the whole body with the soul in it, because of their behavior. And as an aside, he does give uh, somewhat of a very vivid description based upon the Zohar as to what the angel of death is about to do here. And I'll say it just because it's so frightening and uh, vivid. He talks about the angel of death taking a little bit of poison, a tiny little drop of poison, and putting it on the tip of the sword, about to fling it into the body, into the person, into the ship, to destroy it, and thus to take out the soul. And it's interesting. You look at the verse. It talks about the ship was going to be destroyed. It was going to be capsized. And Jonah is totally at ease in the whole story. He's even going to go in the next verse down below deck to go to sleep. He's tired. What this means here is that there is a sense of of urgency that the body has that the soul does not have. On the doorstep of death, the angel of death is already there going through the procedures, the protocols of death, and the body's freaking out, and the soul's at ease. And this is another theme that, that, that we'll see a few times. The body recognizes that its mortality is permanent. The soul has this realization that the soul is not going to die with the death of the body. Jonah, the soul, is at ease. The body, the ship is freaking out. It's going to die. It's going to be destroyed. What's going to be? It's, it has no chance to reconstitute. Once it's died, it's, it's, it's useless. It's going to start to decompose. So what happens The sailors freak out. They cry and they start praying to their gods. The sailors are all the components, are all the forces of the body. And all the things that are held in high regard are suddenly useless to it in this time. They have the, this one had the god of of gold and the god of silver and the god of metal and the god of stone. And they're all totally not helpful in its time of need. They realize that when someone's on their deathbed, the body realizes that things that it held in such high esteem, the things that it dedicated a lifetime to pursue, are useless to it once it passes. So what do they do? They try to lighten the load. They try to offload 
they try to throw overboard all the things. Maybe that will make, maybe that will give the body continuity. What does that mean? They try to lighten the load of the ship. So he gives two explanations, which I found fascinating. The, the body's about to die, and it has the things on it, and it tries to remove it. The things that it valued so greatly, even that it has to leave behind. The idea of when the body passes, it can't take anything with us, with it. It has to, those things are useless to it. Those things are now thrown into the sea, they're gone. But on a different level, he explains that people have, when they're encountering, when they're facing their own demise, there's an upsurge of devotion. There is a realignment of priorities. And when, the way he explains this is someone's about to die, they realize they should have been more righteous. They should have been more kind. And they want to lighten their load. They want to share things with other people. Maybe they were a little bit more selfish in their lifetime. But now that their pending demise is, is right in front of them, they're like, actually, let's give some more charity. Let, 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 let's be more gracious. Let's be more benevolent and giving in kind. Maybe that will help me, which is a very noble thought. But what does Jonah do? Jonah goes beneath the deck. Jonah descends to the hold of the ship. What does that mean? So this I found fascinating. A lot of these things, by the way, are things that I didn't know. And like my eyeballs are like, oh, what? What did I just read? So he says like this. The soul, it enters Adam through the nostrils. Right? Maybe it's supposed to be in the head or in the heart. But every time someone sins, the soul is demoted. It goes down one floor. It goes down and down and down until it's the bottom of the ship. Meaning that a sinner's soul, it's not in their mind, it's not in their intellect, it's not in their nostrils, it's not in their throat, it's not in their heart even. It's in their feet. It's near the dust of their feet. It's been demoted and downgraded to such a degree that it's surrounded by all the trash, by all the dust, by all the lowest levels of impurity. At that time, the angel of death is appointed. Once Jonah is all the way at the bottom, once the soul is all the way at the bottom, now it's kind of beyond repair almost. It's time to invoke the angel of death. Maybe we'll have to start over again. Now, he also points out, and this is something that you, we would totally miss if we read the verse simply. In this, in this verse, it talks about the sailors trying to offload the stuff from the boat, which is called aniyah, same word that it was called until now. And Jonah, he descends to the Sfina. Sfina is also a name for a boat. So why is it changing? In one verse, it's changing the name from an Onia to a Sfina. So he explains that an Onia is like a, a seafaring ship. It's like an invincible, intrepid, titanic ship. That's how you begin life. The body feels invincible. The body feels eternal. Nothing can make this ship sink, not even God, not even the icebergs. And now, at this juncture, it's an old, feeble, weak, it's a tugboat, it's a canoe, it's a raft, it's a kayak, it's a dinghy. It's not up to the task. There's a degradation of the body. And Jonah, he goes to sleep. He almost is resigned. The soul is resigned to its fate, and he's ready to be pulled away by the angel of death. But the captain freaks out. The captain says to him, how could you be sleeping? Go pray to your God. Maybe your God will help us. The captain is, is the mother of all of the forces of the body. It's the heart. And he's calling out to the soul, repent, fix what you can before you die. Maybe we can even rescind this decree. And again, we see this, this contrast. We have this urgency from the body's perspective. The, the heart, the body, the captain, the ship, it realizes it's, it's temporary and wants to preserve its existence. And Jonah, the soul, is almost calm. It knows it will continually exist. And right away, they start throwing lots. The various parts of man are trying to identify the sin. Was it the tongue that sinned, speaking improperly? 
Was it the hands that did sin, the feet? Maybe it was the genitalia? Which part of, of, of this collected being, the ship with all its inhabitants, with Jonah, with the soul, which part is guilty to be warranting, to be deserving of this punishment? And ultimately, the lot falls on Jonah. Because ultimately, the real power, the real force was the soul. The soul could have veered the whole ship towards proper behavior, towards doing the will of God, or it allowed the other forces to overcome it. And thus, yes, the body sinned. But you know what? Ultimately, who's guilty? It's Jonah. It's the soul. In fact, he invokes the Mishnah. The Mishnah tells us in chapter 2 of Apirti Avos, Rabbi Yochman Zakai has his five students, and he asks each one of them to go identify what's the most important characteristic. And each one of them comes up with a different answer, a good eye, a good friend, a good neighbor. And then the winner is the one who says a good heart. And similarly, on the flip side, the worst characteristic is to have a bad heart. Because the heart, is, in this in this example, refers to the soul. Because ultimately, if you have a good soul, if you have an empowered soul, everything else will fall into place. If the soul is not doing its job, if Jonah is not influencing the ship, Ultimately, he's guilty. Yes, the sailors also have their guilt, but that all stems from the source, which is Jonah. And right away, the body, all the sailors begin to investigate Jonah. They asked him, what did you do to bring this misfortune on us? And they, again, list four questions. What's your business? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people do you belong to? Are we guilty alongside of you? Are we also going to get it punished? The body is very nervous. And it's asking all these questions of, of Jonah. What's your business? I'm not asking you, are you a carpenter? Are you a plumber? Are you an orthodontist? What business did God put you in this world for? What was your mission that God sent you to do? Where have you come from? What's your place of origin? You came from heaven. What are you doing? Jonah, soul. How did you descend so low? The soul is being castigated. It's being admonished by the body here on the doorstep of death. What's your country? Which, which land are you from? Don't you remember where you came from? Remember that land, the place where you were comfortable, the place where you originated from? How could you have acted in a way that's so antithetical to the way that you were raised, to the, to where you come from, to where you're, to where you originate from? What people are you from? How do you forget the nation that you belong to? and the mission that it stands for. They asked him all these questions because they know what's happening here and they, they identify the guilty party. It's Jonah, it's the soul. And now the soul is going to have to explain what was the rationale? Why did it do that? And he answers, Ivri Anochi, I am a Hebrew. I fear God, I worship God, who, be, who made both the sea and the land. Again, that recurring motif. He responds to them, I'm a Hebrew. The Hebrew word for Hebrew is Ivri. The word Ivri means from the other side. Mi Avrahanar. Abraham is called from the other side of the river. Here we, again, get a very graphic and frightening citation from the Zohar. What separates the world of the souls from our world? There is a river that separates our world from the world of the soul. Jonah, the soul, declared to all, I am a Hebrew. I'm from the other side. I'm from a different dimension, a different realm than here. I crossed over the river. And to get back, I'm going to have to cross over the same river. But the Zohar tell us, tells us that this is not an ordinary river. There's a river of fire. What this means, I don't know, and I'm not going to answer any questions because I'm going to say I don't know. There's a river of fire separating the world of the souls from our world. The soul was able to traverse the river coming here, no problem. Maybe with some problems, some navigation, some deaf navigation. To get back to its place of origin, it once again needs to traverse that same river. However, on the way back, it depends was the soul injured? Was it damaged? Was it sullied? Was it reduced in its spiritual holiness during its time here? If yes, 
it might need to bathe through that river and it might need to be cleansed and purified, restored to the situation in which it can be a citizen of that world. But if the soul indeed was in the same condition, pristine condition that it came here, that it crossed over the river, river in the original time, well, then it could cross back without any impediments. The soul now realizes that it messed up and it's thinking about what it's going to have to do, how what's going to have to endure to go back home. And he acknowledges that my job, you ask me what business I'm in, my job is to fear God. Of course, we have the book of Ecclesiastes where King Solomon is trying to figure out what's, what's life all about. And he spends, you know, eight or ten chapters trying to figure out the answer. And the bottom line is it's to fear God. It's to have a palpable sense of the dominion of God at all times. And again, Jonah, the souls come to that realization how badly it messed up. The same God who created both the land and the sea, both the soul's place of comfort, its home, and the sea, this turbulent world, both of them the handiwork of God. He made that all. My job was to fear him. I'm going to have to cross back over that river to get back home. The people are terrified. They say to him, what have you done? They discover that he's fleeing from God because he told them. The body, again, is asking the soul, how could you have made such a grievous blunder? How could you have ignored your mission? They're trembling with fear when they hear the account of the soul's origins, its most exalted place of, of origination and its mission. And they realize we were privy to this soul's life. We were here all along the way. We recognize that it's escaped from God. We didn't necessarily know it was a sin because we're a body. But now that the soul is revealing to us its, its history, its backstory, its mission, its consequences, and we know good and well that it did not uphold the standard that it was entrusted with. And therefore, we're terrified. What does this mean for us? They say to him, what can we do to make the sea calm down? Is there anything we could do, the body asks the soul, to forestall or to delay or to rescind the death decree that is upon us? And he responds, the soul does, Jonah does in the story, lift me up, throw me overboard. Lift me up. Those words in the Torah appear elsewhere. They describe when Pharaoh lifted the head of his baker. In essence, Jonah said, there's no choice. It's too late. You have to allow me to die. Another point, where's the soul at this juncture? The soul is all the way by the feet. To leave, it's got to once again be pulled out through the throat, through the place where it came in, all the way back up from the feet, from the below deck, to be taken out of the body from the same place that it went into. And then he says, Jonah says in the story, I know that this whole hurricane, the whole gale is because of me. In effect, there's this, the, the, the pain that the body is experiencing, the pain that the ship is experiencing is all the result of the soul. The body is racked with pain, the body is suffering, but that's only because the angel of death, the quote-unquote wind and forces that the Almighty is employing here, they just want the soul. And the second the soul's out, the body's calm and at ease, its pain ceases. They get this terrible account. There's nothing to do to save this enterprise. And they say, you know, we're going to try anyhow. So what do they do? Even after Jonah tells them, there's only one solution. You got to let me go overboard. That's, that's the only way to get out of this predicament. That's the only way to end the pain of the body, the pain of the ship. They say, you know what? We're going to try anyhow. And they quickly try to row to shore. And it is futile. The sea grew stormier still. The body's resisting the soul's resignation to its fate and is desperately trying to stave off its death. They want to row to shore. What's the shore? That's the land. That's the Olam Abba. They want to say, okay, well, let's try at the last moment. To, maybe there's a way for us to undo this. Let's go to the, to, to the shore. But it's 
efforts are in vain. It's not going to help. There's a certain point of no return. There's a certain point in the death protocol that repentance doesn't work. And, and, and Jonah in this story, in this allegory, Jonah and the body and the ship, they have reached that point beyond which even repentance is not going to be effective. So the body starts crying out to God. They cried out to the Lord, please, God, don't let us perish on account of this person's life. Again, we see this terror, this urgency that the body has, the soul doesn't seem to share. It realizes that it could be very well punished alongside Jonah, alongside the soul. It does not want to be punished alongside the soul. And the, the Gona Vilna, when he talks about this, he's elaborating a lot more than I am, but he talks about how, you know, who's the real guilty party here? The guilty party is the soul. The body, after all, maybe didn't know any better. He quotes the Midrash. The Midrash gives an analogy. You had two people that committed the identical offense against the king. One of them was a simpleton, a peasant, a villager. And the other one was a minister, was a member of the nobility, of the aristocracy. And both of them were placed on a platform and were judged. And the king noticed that the king's the judge, and he says that both of them did the identical infraction, the identical crime. But the king decided to acquit the peasant and to convict the minister. And people said to the king, it's not fair. They both did the same crime. Why should one of them be acquitted and the other one of them be punished very severely? And the king responded, well, the villager, simpleton, he's ignorant. They don't know how they're supposed to behave around the king. They cannot be held guilty for their, for their behavior. But the, the, the nobleman, the minister, they should have known better. Therefore, they're guilty. So similarly over here, yes, the body was entirely condoning of the desires of the soul. And it participated. It's a co-conspirator in the crimes. The soul committed the crimes. The body committed the crimes as well. They did it in unison. But you know what? The soul should have known better. And therefore, he's the one who's really guilty. And the body says, I should not be held guilty. Don't punish me. Just punish the soul. And indeed, they lifted Jonah and they threw him overboard. And right away, the sea stopped raging. There's a very dramatic, shall we say, if we need any more drama. There's a very dramatic account here that as the angel of death is coming closer and closer, the soul is being brought up from the feet and there's this interaction that the soul has with each part of the body. It's saying goodbye. And finally, it's taken out of the body. It's thrown into the sea. It's the sea of judgment. And right away, the body grows still. The body is no longer racked with any pain, any suffering. The final verse of chapter 1 describes what the body or what the Sailors, how they reacted to this revelation. The bodies, they're, they're petrified. The men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and they made vows. I'll read you a citation here that is quoted by the Gona Vilna from the Zohar. On the day of someone's death, the four corners of the universe go into a state of intense judgment. A proclamation from the upper world is heard in all kinds of universes. Again, what this means, it's very advanced, so I don't know, but I think it's vivid enough uh, and it's relevant enough for us to, to, to at least read it. If the person is righteous, all the universes, the 271, 70 of them that are being discussed here, they come out to welcome him in a state of great joy. But if he's not righteous, woe unto him and woe unto his portion. A black rooster begins calling up to the gates. At first, it calls out, Behold, the day of Hashem is coming, a day of cruelty, rage, burning anger, make the land destitute, and he will annihilate the sinners from it. It calls out a second time. He forms mountains and creates winds. He recounts to a person what were his deeds. And at that time, as the person is facing this initial level of judgment, the person sits and listens 
to the testimony and acknowledges that it's all righteous and is all indeed true. At that time, the rooster calls out and says, Who does not fear you, O king of the nations? And the body in this time, the body hears the ruling and it acknowledges that it is true. And the Golden Villain brings another midrash here. It says that the ways of God are different than the ways of mankind. If you have a human king, what happens when a human king sentences someone to death? They have to gag the guilty party because otherwise he'd be raining maledictions and curses upon the king. Whereas the Holy One, blessed is he, God, when someone is sentenced to death, that person is totally silent because the ruling is completely just and the person knows it and acknowledges it. And that's the meaning here, that the body or the sailors, they offered a sacrifice to God, they took vows, they accepted what happened to it with understanding and with love. That's the first chapter based upon this level brought to us by the Gona Vilna. But clearly, the story is not over. Thenceforth, we're not going to be following the ship. Jonah, the soul, has been removed from the ship, and he's going to undergo all kinds of tribulations, all kinds of judgment. He's going to have a rebirth. And when I researched this, I, I, I came to the recognition that we're not going to actually have time to see what happens to Jonah. What does it mean that he's thrown into the belly of the fish? What does it mean that he spit from one fish to another fish? What is the meaning behind him being spit out a second time, given a second chance? What is the architecture of the uh, reincarnation that's being described here? I, 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 obviously, if you've heard this till, till now, you, you, you already probably know the, uh, the next part of the story. But I, I think we definitely have a very valuable way of reading this portion. We immediately see how it relates to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the time that we're trying to repent. We're trying to purify ourselves. Is there a more valuable reading than this very intense dialogue or, or narrative that happens right before someone's about to die? Right before that, that feeling of, of pain and regret, what did I do wrong? How could I have fixed it? What was I thinking? Didn't I act so foolishly? And, and what's wrong with me? The questions that are asked to Jonah, we can ask ourselves. It's a very topical, very relevant idea that it's worthwhile of us, you know, as the waning hours of Yom Kippur, it's, just, it's Yom Kippur afternoon, a very valuable set of ideas to think about, to ruminate upon on this, on this day. If there is an interest... I'm willing to next time continue with the story because it is, uh, I found it very interesting and I sh- I'm sure you will as well. But I think it's a, it's a, it's definitely something to think about. It's a new kind of format, as I promised. It's not something that we typically do, but on Yom Kippur, we do read the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah on its simple level is all about repentance. On this level, it too could all be about repentance. And yes, it is a little terrifying. It is a little frightening, but you know what? If there's a day in the year that we should maybe have a little bit of trepidation about what we're living for, what are the consequences of our behavior, of uh, trying to come into grips with maybe we're not living the ideal, idyllic life that we really ought to be doing and to hopefully realign our priorities and our values for the year upcoming, to repent to God, to restore our soul to the way maybe it was prior to try to cleanse it from all the sins that we accumulate over the year, start off the year fresh. Maybe our repentance won't actually last till the next year, but you know what? I mean, Kipper at least will come to the, to the decision point of saying, yes, we're, we're in. We want to live that life that is the ideal version of ourselves. It's a very valuable process of, of purification. This is the day of holiness, the day of purification. This is the day that is most auspicious, most primed for repentance. The book of Jonah is a part of that. Of course, the prayer is a part of it. In the previous years, we talked about Yom Kippur in general, repentance in general. We, we did a bunch of podcasts on that subject. Uh, those are, of course, still relevant. But I thought this was a very 
wonderful a window into a different kind of learning that we're not typically accustomed to doing. But again, with lessons that are tremendously relevant and valuable as we are preparing for the powerful day of Yom Kippur uh, that is swiftly upcoming. So thank you all for listening. This was tons of fun. It actually worked out a lot better than I anticipated. Uh, my email address, of course, is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I try to get uh, to every question in a timely fashion, but it has been a little bit challenging lately, so forgive me if, uh, if I've been a little bit late in responding to your emails. Uh, thank you all, and I'll see y'all after Yom Kippur.